distinguished ladies and gentlemen. My name is Ernest Aite, and I am the Secretary General of the African Research Universities Alliance. I'm very, very pleased to welcome you to this morning's Arua Guild Info session. Our event this morning is aimed at providing a detailed presentation of the European Union funding calls for applications currently or soon open that may be of interest to Arua and the Guild Universities, where we focus on doctoral training funding opportunities between African and European universities. Here I'm talking about Erasmus Capacity Building in Higher Education and the Marius Kovodotel Curie Actions. During the info session, uh, you will have the opportunity to ask questions to staff from the DG, Education, Youth, Sport and Culture, and then the Research Executive Agency. I'm very, very pleased that you found time to join us. Now that we know why we are doing this, let me talk briefly about uh, Arua and the Guild, uh, that what we had, we've been doing together. Indeed, we began our collaboration in 2018, uh, simply because we do find a common areas of interest. Uh, we find a strong interest in trying to build up higher education in the region. Uh, we find a strong interest in research and innovation uh, as a part of the European Union and African Union partnership. Uh, the two things that are driving us, the fact that uh, for most of Africa, uh, the research that is used by governments, the research that is used by various agencies comes from the public universities, about 60 to 90% of that's coming from the public universities. So Arua and the Guild have a strong interest in supporting the European Union and the African Union to achieve the Agenda 2063, uh, built on the understanding that the knowledge is what is going to make the realization of this uh, possible. Uh, we have, through our collaboration, a published a position paper and also a concept note. Uh, we have contributed in very significant ways towards an understanding of uh, what is ha happening in the area of research uh, in Africa and how the European Union has been supporting this. All of this contributed to the development of the ARISE program, uh, which uh, today is, has become the flagship initiative to support research in Africa. Uh, besides, we have been working on developing uh, doctoral education in the region. Um, we have supported or we plan to support uh, 20 doctoral schools for up to 100 doctoral students each year uh, with support from the African Union and EU partnership. So clearly uh, in doing this, in having this uh, event, uh, we are focused on how we can uh, support the African Union and the European Union in their partnership to build a much more elaborate knowledge society in Africa. Uh, that's what has brought us here today. And I'm very happy that our program allows us to talk to uh, many of the people who are key uh, to making this happen. I'm, I'm very happy that uh, in, the, in the program that we have today, except for some minor changes that have been made to it, We'll be listening to uh, Deidre Lennon, who will be speaking to us on capacity building higher education and about the ERAS Force Plus course. Uh, we'll be listening to um, staff from the MSC. And I'm very, very pleased that uh, we will we'll be listening to uh, be represented largely by uh, very knowledgeable people in, in this particular area. Uh, apart from Deidre, uh, we'll also be paying attention to Nancy, Nancy Idjokutu, uh, Pominya. Uh, Nancy is uh, going to be addressing us on the research initiatives that are available. Uh, we also have, uh, in fact, indeed, after, after Deirdre, the, the second to speak will be Claire Morrell, and after Claire, we'll have Nancy, and then after Nancy Idjokutu, Pominya, we'll have Audrey Arfi, and then finally, uh, Julie Lepretre. So, this is the order in which they'll be speaking, and I'm very, very pleased to invite Deirdre to address us. 
So uh, thank you very much, Ernest. And uh, my name is uh, Jan Pomowski, um, Secretary General uh, from the Guilds. So I'm um, uh, Ernest's colleague, uh, Ernest in Arua, and and um, doing the same thing for the Guild. Uh, and Deirdre, yes, I mean, if I if if we can maybe start with with your uh, presentation. You've been uh, your policy officer for cooperation with Africa. Um, it'd be great to hear from you some more details around the new sort of Erasmus course and how they. Um, relate to capacity building in higher education. I would ask all our um, all those um, listening in to join in the conversation to already begin asking questions in the Q and A sections of the uh, of of the of, of the Zoom function. So if you have questions, do start asking them now. We'll we'll really do our best to really go through these uh, questions in the Q and A session. Um, there's a good 20 minutes, 25 minutes that we have for that. So please please do do go ahead uh, and engage. Um, as, as we go along. Um, so, Claire, uh, Deirdre, the, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to highlight today, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, colleagues from, uh, from both continents. I'd like to highlight the opportunities that are available for uh, universities um, and research organizations um, to support doctoral education through Erasmus. Um, Erasmus Plus, well, um, today's presentation, I'm going to briefly explain uh, what is Erasmus Plus, and I'm going to focus on two of the actions in particular, international credit mobility and capacity building in higher education, and then I'll provide you with some further information, resources, uh, links, uh, etc. Um, just to summarize very briefly, for those of you who don't know Erasmus+, Plus, Erasmus+, Plus is the EU's program to support education, training, uh, youth uh, and sport uh, in the European Union, but also beyond and for cooperation uh, across the world. The program provides funding for, pro uh, for programs, for projects, scholarships and mobility. And it's our main instrument uh, in the field of education and higher education in particular um, for fostering cooperation between EU and notably Africa. Um, we are now entering the new phase of the program. So um, the previous phase was 2014, 2020, and now we're looking ahead for the, uh, the next seven year period. And um, in this uh, new phase of the program, um, there are a series of overarching priorities which you will see reflected in the different actions uh, quite significant, significantly, excuse me. Um, there is focus on quality in education, um, the roles of um, teachers, a very uh, strong focus on higher education on the European universities, um, inclusion and gender equality. That was one of the issues that came up in the evaluation of the previous phase. We need to reach out more to underrepresented groups in the program. The green and digital twin transitions um, focus very highly um, in the new phase of the program and the geopolitical dimension of the program. Uh, we want to be able to offer, as uh, alongside the programs that our member states are offering, um, means for uh, cooperation between Europe and the partners, our partners across the world, and notably uh, Africa. And in that context, um, I refer also to the Secretary General's introduction. Um, Erasmus is one of the ways to support the partnership between the African Union and the European Union. Um, support also the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals, uh, contribute to um, Africa's Agenda uh, 2063, and to um, bring a coherent um, approach to um, our um, support and interventions uh, in across Africa, and to build up, um, how can I say it, uh, a stronger engagement in the previous in the next phase of the program um, just to give you a picture here in the previous phase of the program uh, sub-sahara africa was significantly underfunded um, we um, 
did not uh, advertise uh, so strongly. Sorry, uh, sorry. Did, 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 can, I, can I just interrupt briefly? We're getting quite a lot of comments about the black box <laughs> yeah. that's visible. And uh, just to explain that we weren't able um, to do anything about that in the tests for, for this, in the run up to this session. So, um, Deirdre, I, th I think it's. We'll be leaving uh, the slides. Uh, we'll, we'll, we can share the slides afterwards, yeah. presumably, and we can send it yeah. around to participants that you've got the full, um, the, the, you, you will have the full original version. Yeah, I've tried to move the, um, the, the people, the, <laughs> um, the panelists to the side as much as possible. I'm not sure if that works, but yes, we'll, we'll give you all the information and, um, and uh, there'll be uh, information, further information sessions also uh, available for participants. Um, I'm sorry, um, Laura, did you have an, anything else to say? Sorry? Is it better now? Oh, it's better now. So that's that's good. Yeah, so apologies. For this. Thank you. Um, over the previous phase of the program, as I was saying, Sub-Sahara Africa was significantly underfunded. Here you have a picture, a snapshot of uh, the different regions of the world. And um, the Western Balkans and the neighborhood region were very much the focus of, uh, of the funding. And whilst there was demand uh, across Africa, we weren't uh, able to fund a sufficient number of, pro of projects um, uh, with African universities. And I'm very pleased in the next slide, you'll see that Africa, Sub-Sahara Africa has become the highest funded region in the world. Um, so we will, the, the, the biggest budget that will be available in the next seven years of the program will be for Sub-Sahara Africa. North Africa will continue to have the comfortable and high budget it had previously, but now Sub-Sahara Africa will, um, will be able to contribute much more significantly. The actions that are particularly interesting for today's conversation on uh, doctoral education um, are um, the exchanges of university students and staff um, at all levels. So um, uh, PhD fellows, uh, staff, um, academic and administrative can exchange um, with um, uh, universities in Europe. And the other action that I want to um, elaborate a bit on is capacity building in higher education, uh, which are partnerships between universities on both sides. And just to give you an idea again in terms of budget, we aim to uh, achieve uh, 105,000 mobilities by 2027. Now, in, by tw um, in the previous phase of the program, um, 35,000 students and staff from Africa came to Europe. Um, in the next phase of the program, we'll be funding up to 70,000 staff and students from uh, Africa to come to Europe. Um, and in terms of capacity building projects, in the past program, we were able to fund approximately six projects a year for Sub-Sahara Africa. Now we'll be able to fund approximately 40 projects a year. So you can see that there's a significant increase and we really need you to take this opportunity up and to help uh, use this funding. Um, the, uh, I'm going to be using some terminology during uh, the presentation, and I'd just like to clarify this. In the program, in Erasmus+, Plus, we have what we call program countries. So the program countries are basically the member states and the countries, the third countries, such as Turkey, Liechtenstein, Iceland, um, uh, um, North Macedonia, etc., which are associated to the program. So you have those countries on one side, and then you have what, what were called the partner countries, which are in fact the non-associated third countries across the world. And Erasmus functions between these two. So program countries, partner countries, um, and the new terminology, um, which you, you see in this slide. Um, the first action I want to talk about uh, were the exchanges, the mobilities of staff and students. So this is called international credit mobility. And this action is based on bilateral arrangements between a university in Africa and a university in a program country. So let's take the example of um, a university in uh, Italy, Rome, a university in Rome. So, these two universities will set up an agreement by which they're going to share 
exchange students and staff um, across a period of time. Now, if I give you some more details here, the partnership between these two universities can last between two or three years. And basically it, it allowed students at all levels to undertake um, study periods or traineeships in Europe um, for a maximum of one academic year. And it allows for staff mobility for teaching or retraining purposes um, between five and 60 days. Um, the grant uh, provides support for the organization of this mobility, the travel, the visas, and then uh, support for accommodation, food subsistence, etc., uh, during the period when the person is, is abroad. The mobility is arranged um, in the framework of uh, a bilateral agreement between the two universities, and it lays out very clear learning agreements and expectations, um, uh, learning outcomes that will be acquired by the students, how will these be um, recognized, uh, credited um, by the um, home institution, mobility agreements for staff, uh, purpose, uh, accompanying measures, et cetera, et cetera. So th this, quality framework, uh, which is applied in Europe already, also applies for these arrangements between uh, European and African universities. As I mentioned, there, are, there is support provided for the, for the mobilities, uh, quite, quite generous support, um, and uh, the universities will receive an organizational support amount, which um, is a lump sum, basically, depending on the number of people that are moved. Now, if you want to take part in this action, this action is actually managed by each of our member states. So the national Erasmus agencies in Italy, in this case, um, the University of Rome, my example, the University of Rome will submit an application to the Erasmus office in Italy, proposing to um, uh, undertake an Erasmus partnership with the University of Ghana. Um, under this um, proposal, they will move X number of people in various disciplines um, for certain purposes. And then the um, Erasmus office in Italy will allocate the funds to the University of Rome, who can then sign the agreements with the University of Ghana and begin implementing the mobility. So the application will be made by the European University directly to their Erasmus office. Here I give you the um, uh, link to the list of national agencies um, and they will be providing uh, the universities in Europe all the necessary support for them to do their application. The other action is the capacity building in higher education action, which are partnerships, which basically allow universities um, to support um, uh, increasing, enhancing relevance, quality, uh, modernization, uh, and accessibility of higher education, in this case, in Africa, helping it to contribute to sustainable um, and social and economic development. These projects uh, can vary. The, um, uh, projects can undertake curriculum development, uh, introduce new teaching methodologies, uh, support uh, university enterprise corporations, set up technology transfer um, arrangements across the university, support international relations, but they can also um, uh, do activities such as creating doctoral schools, um, introducing uh, new uh, research um, uh, facility, facilities. Now, uh, the action will not support the applied research itself, but basically can support the university to build up its research capacity. So um, I thought this uh, action would be particularly interesting for universities uh, in Africa, which really want to uh, work on the research environment um, and the, uh, uh, the context in which um, young researchers will be, will be um, working in, in African universities. Um, compared to the pre those of you who know the program, compared to the previous phase, we'll be um, putting more emphasis now on the overarching priorities of the, um, uh, of the program, so on green 
sustainable uh, recovery uh, and development, digital skills, inclusion and diversity. And um, the action will be aligned to regional needs. So for Sub-Sahara Africa, for, for instance, the next two years, um, uh, there, there will be um, priority areas, um, which are very, very wide, in fact, and which sort of help universities focus their interventions and uh, increase impact. The uh, novelties here is that we're going to have three types of projects. The first project is for newcomers in particular, but not only, but the smaller projects, um, which will allow universities to test and trial to do pilot sort of measures to get used to international cooperation if they're not um, engaged in it yet, um, and to provide support um, for, for, for initiatives. These projects will generally last two to three years and will be funded um, uh, up to uh, 400,000 euro. Um, then we have the classical um, type of projects, um, in, like in the previous phase, which are called partners, partnerships for transformation. These projects are focusing on innovation, um, innovation, university business um, uh, governance. Um, and I think these are the ones where um, uh, Aruwa's constituency will probably find, uh, find their place. Um, these partnerships will um, uh, also last two to three years and can be funded up to 800,000 euro. Then we have the structural reform measures. These are projects which are working at systems level and must involve the ministries. So for instance, um, when I was talking about the establishment of uh, doctoral schools, an example could be uh, a country which um, wants to um, uh, introduce new legislation, wants to support the process in the universities of setting up the, the, the country's first doctoral schools, could do this with the support of, a, of, of an Erasmus project. So here projects can go up to four years and up to a funding amount of one million euro. Um, we've simplified the financial, uh, the financial funding mechanisms. And um, one last thing here is that we have um, also some targets for Sub-Sahara Africa. Uh, we, would, we need to ensure that countries, uh, least developed countries and countries which have benefited less from the program in the past um, have opportunities here. So I'd encourage uh, Arua's constituency to partner up with other universities in the region and bring them along with you in the process. And we'll also have to ensure that no single country will get all of the funding, uh, basically. So there are several kind of um, uh, additional uh, mechanisms which have been introduced so that we can uh, ensure that. Um, here, you, your uh, universities, uh, you need to have at least two different EU member states involved in the project. And you need at least two universities from a single country in Africa or several countries uh, in Africa involved in the application. And you can apply yourselves. Uh, if the universities in Africa wish to apply directly, they can do that. And here you'll be applying um, to Brussels, to the headquarters here, to our executive agency, which is in charge of this action. And I've given the details there. And I'm going to quickly just um, give you uh, some information, uh, some additional information, which is useful. Um, sorry, just to say that the call for Erasmus is going to be published in the last week of October, first week of, of November. So it's always around that period. It's one call with all the actions are published. And then the deadlines for these actions for submitting proposals will be around February, February, March, depending. I'm going to skip this and go straight to this slide. Um, please check if you're registered um, for, um, if you want to participate in Erasmus projects, you will need to register your organization. That gives you kind of an identity card for Erasmus and for all the other programs, um, uh, European programs. So you could already start by doing that is to make sure that you um, are registered in the um, fundings and um, funding and tender opportunities portal. 
Um, if you'd like to see uh, projects that are underway already in Africa or in any other region, you can go to our Erasmus Plus project results website um, and just call up countries, um, types of projects. If you already know names of projects, you can do a search there and see the types of uh, activities that they have undertaken. And we'll start rolling out materials and uh, information campaigns, webinars and such like as soon as the call is published at the end of October. Thank you very much. Deirdre, thank you so much for this uh, really wonderful and, and informative presentation. It's fantastic to see that so much more support is now um, available for, for universities, um, both for kind of one-to-one -one exchange and collaboration and for, for a broader uh, regional uh, collaboration. Um, so I already have a number of questions here, um, but I also see that people are already introducing themselves to each other in the chat. Um, it's wonderful to see, of course, many of our members, uh, both from Aru and the Guild, uh, participating um, in this chat. But it's also wonderful, so a warm welcome also to those who are those who are from universities who are not our members. It's it's also really wonderful that you are you are there. This is not meant. I mean, even though the the invitation was sent primarily to our members, it's this is not meant to be an exclusive um, gathering here. So um, there are already some people here who are already indicating kind of um, collaborations that they're searching. That's also really very welcome. Um, I have one um, uh, question from Tomi, which is about whether the funding um, can be used for policy reform on the regional uh, level. So I guess this is a question really, I guess, about, about impact. Yes, it can. And in fact, I'm hoping that uh, uh, universities in Africa will use the uh, Erasmus Plus to support the harmonization uh, gender across Africa. Um, and so, for instance, universities in East Africa or in uh, Southern Africa can get together to support their, um, their regional integration processes. Um, so, yes, definitely. Uh, that's, um, that's and we'll be encouraging, in fact, um, uh, projects that involve several countries, uh, several African countries together in the, in the applications. Great. Uh, further a question, another question now from Annette uh, skorstedt Hansten, who is uh, from History and Global Studies at Aarhus University in Denmark. So, um, she, and she's asking really around this uh, issue of building, of capacity building. So will there be any support for number one, access to database and library resources, and B, so number two, um, will there be support for the sustainability of universities' retention potential? So she's not necessarily referring for salaries for new staff, uh, but, but some other types of support. Yes, perhaps. Um, well, on the first one, yes, indeed. Um, uh, the capacity building action does support access to uh, databases and libraries. Um, uh, so when we say uh, we, we're basically supporting the upgrading of facilities and everything that that entails. Um, so that's that's possible. And in terms of sustainability for universities retention, um, the uh, staff costs um, for, uh, for universities that are involved in these projects uh, is covered by the project. Um, so for the duration of the three, four years that you're engaged, all the people that are engaged in the efforts um, can, uh, you know, um, are financially supported from the project. Um, obviously, once the project is finished, the university will then have to integrate, you know, the, the services within uh, the normal staffing uh, and, and we'll have to in fact uh, explain also how they how they plan to address that uh, the sustainability issue in the application up front. Actually Claire on, on that point I think that's a really important uh, question do you have some good examples I mean maybe off the top of your head of, of kind of uh, best practice or, 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 or places where you see that that sustainability has really worked very well, where these universities really have managed very successfully to kind of build on, on that initial period of funding? I think the projects that involve, um, you know, that develop a business model from the very start and that, for instance, will in, uh, engage in the private sector the, or the wider environment, even the, the public, uh, the local authorities and such like, and where they kind of build up a uh, dynamic whereby the university is offering a, a service um, to the community or to uh, the sector and such like, they generally have no problem afterwards. Um, it can be from just offering, you know, um, uh, uh, traineeships for students 
uh, in the enterprises, getting you know getting the uh, the companies uh, providing uh, input into the into the curriculum, such like you know these kind of um, introduce these elements into the project, and I think there's a, a, a stronger chance of sustainability afterwards. Great. Can I just say on a practical note of terminology? So, so the question that that, that Deirdre is addressing, I'm I'm clicking dismissed, and that's simply so that that they go into the other box. It's not that it's not meant to be dismissive or derogatory. It's just it's just the easiest way of doing it. So I just wanted to make that clear. Um, Mark has a. Um, a question I think that that fits in quite nicely, which is really about whether the project can have a specific focus, for instance, climate change, or is that indeed something you would encourage? Yeah, um, in fact, we'll be we'll be announcing the priorities for sub-Sahara Africa, and I very much expect that green transition will be one of them. And so we will expect, <clears throat> for instance, universities to be focusing on climate change. Some projects might, um, we see a lot of them already, are already working, for instance, in the field of renewable energies. Um, other projects might be working on agriculture. So yes, that, that, um, that's exactly it. But what we want um, now is that projects do not only focus on the contents, um, so the teaching program, I want to develop a teaching program in, but to really work on the ecosystem. So not a, you know work on the on the place uh, the the intentions why this um, curriculum is intended what is expected locally and nationally regionally and to build all that into the into the project uh, proposal. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so then there's a further question on uh, whether the credits for uh, so how are the credits for modules taken acquired and I have to say I'm not I'm I'm probably you, you yeah. Uh, yeah, um, this, so in the framework of the exchanges are the study periods that students will be doing uh, in Europe, for instance. At the end of the study period, the student will receive a certain amount of European credits uh, for, the, for the study period. But beforehand, the two universities will have elaborated how the African university intends to recognize that in terms of equivalence. So um, when the student then returns to their home country, that credit acquired in Europe becomes either is recognized as such or is integrated into the student's uh, learning path. And uh, then the student continues their, 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 their academic uh, program uh, at home. So um, yes, it, it's a question of, uh, of equivalence, you know, and that needs to be laid out at the very beginning of the project so that the students know um, how that is going to function when they return home after, this, after the study period. Thank you, Deirdre. Um, a, a question from uh, Evans Ozebuyan, uh, and I hope that I, I'm pronouncing these uh, names correctly, but um, so does Erasmus Plus support a PhD program hosted like as a, at a university like Macquarie from the development to its implementation? Sorry, that's the wrong question. Sorry, uh, is, sorry. Um, is is the um, is it is are the calls only devoted to doctoral studies and research? So, is presumably it's all there are also other types of mobility that this funds. I think yes, this yes, refers yes. to the first part of your presentation. Yeah. I think. Sorry, yes. Um, uh, the the study the study periods the mobilities um, basically can be for students at a bachelor, a master, or a PhD level. Now, uh, bear in mind that you won't be doing um, the, uh, a full fellowship uh, under Erasmus because Erasmus supports only up to one year maximum. Okay, so um, you'd hear more about that in Marie Curie, um, the uh, doctoral training programs uh, will be explained after. Here, it would be in the context of the PhD, the fellow could um, do part of the assignment in Europe. Um, so that, that, that's what's offered under Erasmus. And then there's a question here about uh, from Christopher Francis, who's completing his master's. And is it possible for him to um, apply directly for PhD study uh, in Europe under Erasmus? No. Um, so this will be Marie Curie, uh, which you'll hear about after. So this is, uh, um, yeah. And, and so basically, um, and, and otherwise, if he, if he doesn't, if it's not through the Marie Curie program, then it's, it's really around, uh, it's, it's really, it would be involving an exchange between his home university, university, Cape Town, and yeah. a partner university in Europe. Yes, and, and there's other funding, for instance, uh, France, Germany, uh, etc. Uh, many of our member states 
offer opportunities for these uh, for that kind of support. Um, then there's uh, Saint Kizita Omala who's asking whether Erasmus uh, Plus supports a PhD program hosted at, at say Makerere University from its development to its implementation. Yes. Um, give examples. So from development all the way to implementation, but not the actual research that's undertaken in the framework of the program. So if you know you can you can develop the PhD program um, under the framework of Erasmus, but then after that. Um, the running and the operating of this program is up to the university to undertake. Um, uh, Erasmus doesn't go beyond the development uh, up to its uh, implementation. And uh, thank you, uh, Deirdre. And, and, and then uh, Peter Marson uh, from uh, Oslo University asked whether, whether it's, it, it will be encouraged to connect projects funded by Erasmus Plus to, to, uh, to connect those to projects funded in the framework of the Africa Initiative of Horizon Europe. Definitely, definitely. And we're hoping to capture this, in fact, to a certain extent in the Africa EU in innovation agenda, whereby we can kind of explain that depending on the direction you're coming from, uh, Erasmus, uh, Marie Curie, Horizon um, are all parts of uh, this, uh, this joint agenda between the two continents um, for, for, for supporting, uh, for supporting uh, higher education, research and innovation. And um, yeah. Great, and, and Mark, before I get to your question, I've got to ask this question from the anonymous s &D, which kind of jumps at me as a, as a, as a humanist. So is, is the program for science related courses alone? No, not at all. <laughs> we have some- Good answer. <laughs> yeah, we have some beautiful projects, an Ethiopian one um, with Ireland, and not because I'm Irish, I'm just saying it just happens to be, um, in uh, music and dancing. Um, so really um, uh, everything's possible, but of course you'll have to see what are considered priority for Sub-Sahara Africa. And bearing in mind that it's sufficiently large, I think for everybody to find a place. Humanities are there, they'll be, you know, there's a place for everybody. Mm -hmm. so, so Mark is just asking about um, really the options for multilateral projects. Um, so, and he's giving an example. Um, and, and in fact, Mark, this is an example that uh, Ernest RNT and us, us have, have thought about as well in terms of the Guild Uru collaboration, which is precisely the question around the, the Uru centers of excellence that already exist. So for, he's giving the, the example, for instance, on climate change, where you have uh, uh, Cape Town, uh, Ghana, and uh, Nairobi universities uh, already joined up. So, so could this be an opportunity for that center of excellence to really build on on collaborations? Yes, definitely, definitely. Um, obviously, the um, I'm afraid you're stuck with the Europeans though, because Erasmus is European. So you you must include also Europeans in this project. But otherwise, yes, definitely. Uh, please, please do. <laughs> Great, and and so and and Jonathan uh, uh, um is 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 also then going back to the individual researcher uh, uh, issue. So so I, I guess the individual researcher would apply through their institu through an institutional one to one agreement. Is that is that a fair way of? Yeah, under under Erasmus, everything is arranged by the universities. So the 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 researcher the the fellow, excuse me, will be talking to the university and it's in that framework that is taking place. Under Marie Curie, and they'll explain that more, um, there, there are different actions and depending on the actions, the, the, the fellow is either autonomous to the university or, you know, it's no, in fact, I, I prefer that they explain that. But under Erasmus, um, it's through your university that you're going. Mm -hmm. And then David, uh... Akin Wamida is asking really around um, whether um, Erasmus can fund PhD studies um, on urban planning um, and uh, real estate in urban planning in African universities. And I presume that kind of depends on the universities, how they choose to apply and set their priorities, right? Yeah. Yes. And um, well, first of all, I should clarify that we wouldn't fund the PhD studies of the individuals, but we could fund um, the development of this study program um, and then yes it, it depends on the priorities uh, prior, sort of the university's priorities do they intend um, developing programs in those areas and in that case they can uh, submit an application. Mm -hmm. We are beginning to get more and more uh, questions around uh, the postdoctoral research side so so and uh, so Ben uh, Abikoya just just be patient just for a few more minutes and then we'll get right onto that. 
Are there any more uh, questions really on what uh, Deirdre has, um, has presented? Um, any more uh, questions both around the, the collaborative capacity building uh, call that will open up and the, uh, and, and the institution to, the, the opportunities really for institution to institution partnerships? Anything, let me just check in the, so I've just looked at the Q&A, but uh, I haven't seen anything further in the chat. Um, so uh, I think that's probably it uh, for now. Did you, uh, thank you very much. I have to, so I have to say, um, you know, for somebody who is, who is, uh, who is uh, not just Secretary General of the Guild, but is also part of a British, of a UK university, I, I, it, 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 I mean, I thought your presentation was an incredible reminder of what we've lost, as it were, by no, I mean, because it is, it is I mean, the added value of, of Erasmus in, in having this kind of framework that institutional institution, institutions um, and research centers can just slot into, I think is just an incredible opportunity and just, just phenomenal. So thank you very much. And thank you very much to you and your colleagues for, for setting up these opportunities and really for fighting for the kind of budget uh, that has now allowed, uh, allowed this opportunity to be there for us and for, for our benefit. So thank you very much thank you. Um, for that. Um, and I'm, I'm uh, moving on to uh, uh, Claire Morel. And Claire, if you could uh, uh, have, uh, so Claire Morel is head of unit. Um, of uh, the Marie Sklodowska Curie actions. And uh, Claire, it's wonderful that you can be here. You've, you've been a longstanding uh, um, sort of uh, supporter of, of uh, EU African relations and we've, we've had many exchanges with you on this. So thank you very much for joining us and thank you for taking the time, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Jan, you can hear me well? Yes. Yes, okay, thank you very much. So thank you very much for inviting us uh, because I'm not alone here. I'm with my, my colleagues from notably from the Research Executive Agency to present the um, opportunities which are offered in the framework of the Marie Sklodowska Curie Action, so MSCA in short. And I think this um, seminar comes at a really good time because we are we have a number of ongoing calls and this week we are launch, we are launching two new more two new calls. So indeed, I think it's, it's, it's quite the right time if you're interested in applying for the MSCA. So I'll do a general introduction and then two of my colleagues will concentrate on two actions, which are particularly, I think, interesting for our African partners. One is the uh, doctoral networks and the other one is our staff exchange action. But uh, I will briefly mention that there are other actions under MSCA. So if we go to the next, uh, um, next yes. So in fact, the MSCA, so the Marie Sklodowska Curie Action, is a um, program under the Horizon Europe program, which is the EU program for uh, research and innovation. And it's under what we call Pillar One, Excellent Science. It's the pillar which funds um, excellent science, frontier research, breakthrough scientific ideas. And it also allows teaming up uh, of uh, excellent researchers from Europe and beyond. And it equips them, these researchers, with, with new skills and uh, gives them also access to excellent um, research infrastructure. So the budget for the next uh, seven years is 6.6 uh, .6 billion euro uh, just for the MSCA. If we look at the next um, slide, you will see some key figures for, uh, from the past seven years. So in the past seven years, the MSCA have funded uh, 65,000 or have supported 65,000 researchers at all stages of their career. And it includes 25,000 PhD candidates. Uh, it has developed more than 1,000 doctoral programs. So sometimes MSCA is seen as a program, sort of Erasmus for researchers, but it's much more than that because really it funds the development of uh, new um, doctoral programs. Um, it's a program as well, uh, which is very international. More, almost 40% of our researchers are from outside the EU. And it's a program as well, which promotes uh, strong uh, links beyond academia. So you see that in the past seven years, 4,500 companies have been supported through the program. And it's also a program which supports we women to research and contribute to achieving a equal access of uh, women uh, in, in, in science, in research and innovation. In the next slide, 
yes, these are uh, key figures from the past seven years. So the, I mean, we have a number of uh, African researchers, but you see that it's, it's, it's uh, still limited. So we really hope that under uh, Horizon Europe, there will be an increased participation of African researchers and organization in MSCA. So you see here the number of projects, participations, and the type of organizations from Africa which have joined um, MSCA. Half of them are universities, but we also have um, companies, research centers, and also public bodies. Next slide, yes. Uh, in this um, in these slides, I, I mean, this is a slide explaining what are the main features of the program. So as I said, it's a program which funds researchers at all stages of their career. So it starts with the doctoral level and it goes into, uh, let's say, supporting more uh, advanced or more uh, experienced researchers. It's a program which focuses on skills, uh, on career development uh, of researchers and their training. Uh, it promotes as well, not only that it has a positive impact, not only on, on individuals, but also on institutions uh, joining the program. So we see really that there is a, the program allows these organizations, you know, to have a, a more a, a bigger or a stronger visibility, a stronger global attractiveness. It's a bottom-up program, which means that it is open to all scientific disciplines. I mean, we do not organize targeted calls or covering specific fields. It's really open to all scientific and all uh, uh, research areas. And uh, the uh, projects are selected on the basis of their, their excellence, the, uh, their impact, and the quality of their implementation. And of course, it's a program which has a strong and very rich uh, scientific impact. Uh, the program supports the uh, international mobility of, uh, of researchers, but also their cross-sectoral mobility, so mobility between academic and non-academic sector. You will see that we are introducing even some uh, financial incentive to promote this uh, intersectoral mobility and interdisciplinary uh, cooperation. I mentioned it's a program which is open to researchers from all over the world, and we want this really to continue to be the case under Horizon Europe. Uh, and the, it's a program as well, which promotes attractive working and employment conditions. So all uh, our researchers are recruited under employment contracts with uh, guaranteed social security coverage, even when they are early, um, uh, early stage researchers, uh, and they receive monthly allowances to cover their living, their mobility, but also their family costs. Now, if we look at the next slide, uh, you will see the different actions. So today we will concentrate on two of them, the doctoral networks and the staff exchanges, but we can provide uh, afterwards more information on the other actions. So uh, MSCA funds five types uh, of actions, which are quite complementary to, to, to each other, and they cover different types of needs. So our biggest action, it's half of our budget, goes to uh, these international doctoral networks. And it, it includes the traditional, let's say, uh, doctorates, but we also fund uh, industrial doctorates and uh, where, you know, PhD candidates are uh, supervised both by academic and non-academic partners. And uh, we also fund uh, joint doctoral programs. And for these um, doctoral networks, you will hear that uh, they need to be implemented by uh, consortia of um, universities, but also of any organization that can play a role in uh, doctoral, um, doctoral networks. So they, there can be also non-academic partners and they can be established uh, anywhere in the world. And then they offer fellowships to, to, to students from all over the world who want to be enrolled in MSCA doctoral programs. And all these doctoral programs must publish widely uh, the, 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 the doctoral positions on the EURACCESS, which is the portal, the EU portal for, for researchers uh, and, and, and using other channels of communication. Then we have the postdoctoral fellowships for more experienced researchers. And uh, it's, uh, it's for researchers who are interested in doing their research in Europe, but also for European researchers interested in doing their uh, research outside Europe. And it's open to excellent researchers of any nationality. So the second one, the postdoctoral fellowships um, and uh, the hosting institution can be universities, but they can also be research institutions, uh, gain businesses, SME, and any other organizations it can be a hospital, museum, whatever. 
Uh, and uh, there is novelty under the new program is that we grant an additional period of six months for researchers who intend to spend part of their fellowship in the non-academic sector. I forgot to say that the duration of these fellowships is between one and two years. Then we have the staff exchange um, action, uh, which is uh, maybe the easiest one to enter and it's the most international one. So if uh, you're interested in applying for the MSCA, maybe the, 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 the entry point could be the staff exchange one because it's less competitive and it's the most international one. And it supports the, uh, let's say it funds uh, short-term international and intersectoral uh, staff exchanges of uh, any staff, any type of staff involved in uh, research and innovation activities. In fact, uh, we uh, are launching a new call today. So um, you're right on time. And, and uh, usually these, uh, I mean, consortia applying for the staff exchange action are extremely international and are, in, are, are covering really partners from all over uh, the world. Then we have a co-funded actions where we co-fund existing or future or new uh, doctoral programs and uh, postdoctoral uh, fellowships. And uh, our last action that is limited to Europe, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a public out outreach event. It's called the European Researchers Night and it takes place once a year everywhere uh, in, in Europe. My, in my last slides, I, you will see that I have two examples of, of projects in the, yes, the next one. Um, this is an example of uh, projects involving uh, partners from Africa. It's a, a staff exchange project on digitalization uh, towards a sustainable development. So it was selected um, two years ago. The coordinator is a German, uh, organization institute and it involves as you, as you see partners from uh, different organizations in Europe but also five partner uh, partners in in uh, different regions of the world including one from South Africa Stellenbosch University and um, the these partners uh, are connecting with each other I mean they are exchanging researchers dealing with uh, sustainability and digitalization um, and the next slide is an example of an existing doctoral program um, combining competencies in anthropology, human security, African studies. So you see that the, the, the type, let's say, of uh, research um, areas is extremely wide. Um, and uh, it's coordinated by a partner in Denmark, and it has 20 partners uh, outside, uh, outside Europe. And you see uh, instances um, of organizations from, from Kenya, for example, South Africa. Uh, and we have, of course, lots of uh, similar projects and maybe my colleague Julie who will uh, uh, intervene a little bit later in the discussion can tell you where you can find um, examples of such projects. So that's all for my, uh, for my introduction. And I will now leave the floor, I think, to um, unless there are questions, but maybe questions can be asked at the end of all the presentation on the MSCA. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Claire. And uh, if I can maybe now ask uh, first Nancy and then Audrey uh, uh, to uh, take the floor. So Nan Nancy Jokoto um, and Audrey Avi are both uh, from the European Research Executive Agency, and they really deal with, with uh, um, the MSCA calls and uh, with with making MSCA work and so uh, it's wonderful that you're here and it'd be great if you yeah if you could uh, Nancy if you could start Nancy if you can switch on your camera and your mic yeah perfect thank you uh, can you hear me I'm... yes we can't see you yet yeah I have a message saying that the host has asked you to start a video okay I think I press push the button yeah perfect. that's fine Okay, so I will start by sharing uh, my screen. Just one second. Yeah, can you can you see the presentation? Yes, perfectly. Thank you. Okay, um, just one second, so, because I'm not very used to this. Just just ask uh, to go to the next slide. I will be doing it then. See. Yeah, can you see it now? Yes. Okay, I will start. So uh, my name is Nancy Jokotopomenia and I work at the European Research Executive Agencies. And today I'm gonna give you a presentation on uh, one of EU funding scheme, which is the staff exchanges. 
under the framework of Marie Sodowska Curie Actions. So I will first focus on the main features of the program and then provide you with some information in case you want to submit a proposals. And I'll end my presentation by providing you with an example of a project that is being funded under the program. So um, let's first start with the main features of the program. As you can see from the slide, um, the Staff Exchanges program has four objectives. The program mainly supports uh, the mobility of uh, researchers <clears throat> in three dimensions, being international, intersectoral, and interdisciplinary. Through these exchanges, um, knowledge transfer is being provided between participating organizations and collaboration between academic and non-academic sectors is being uh, <clears throat> strengthened, thus leading to strengthened cooperation across the globe. So in terms of the added value of the program for staff members and for organizations, I think that uh, one of the key features that is highly appreciated by um, RNI organizations is that it's a bottom-up approach. Um, so what's in for staff members? Uh, first of all, it's an excellent experience to acquire new skills and competencies through interaction with a wide range of stakeholders. Staff participating in the program usually confirm that it has helped them to increase their employability and career prospects. Uh, what did they gain? International exposure, as well as capacity to enhance their networks and their visibility. Lastly, uh, for organization, as you can see from this slide, um, they can benefit from transfer of knowledge, strengthen collaborative networks and RNI capacity. For both staff members and organizations, what is interesting is that ideas can be converted into products, processes, and services. So uh, who can be eligible um, in, the, in the program? Uh, as you can see from the slide, um, Staff exchanges proposals should be presented by a consortium of several participating organizations in both the academic and the non-academic sector. By academic sector, we mean, for instance, higher education entities and research organizations. And by non-academic, we mean, for instance, companies, including SMEs, other entities such as museums and foundations or NGOs. While there's no maximum uh, amount of uh, participants, there's a minimum. Uh, there is a need to have uh, participants in three different, different countries, two of which needs to be located in a different EU member state or in an associated country. If organizations are from the same sector, there must be at least one organization from a, thir a non-associated third country. So uh, let's now drift into the eligible exchanges. I won't go into much detail uh, because I think that you will be given uh, the presentation at the end of this uh, presentation. Uh, but I want to uh, maybe focus on the fact that for third countries, the secondments need to be sent. The, I mean, the staff members being sent uh, need to go to an EU organization, I mean, not being non-academic or academic, in one EU member state or in one of the associated countries. So uh, now we'll see who is eligible for the program. Um, so <clears throat> any, type, any type of staff involved in RNI activities, mostly researchers, but also administrative, managerial, technical staff are eligible. I insist on the fact that they need to be involved in research and innovation activities. Uh, researchers are also eligible at any stage of their career, meaning that they can be either at an early stage of their career or they can also be more experienced. <clears throat> what so, is also important to know is that they need to be actively engaged in research and innovation activities for at least one month 
prior to the secondment. Three key principles uh, in terms of eligibility are important to know. First of all, secondments last between one and 12 months. Second, staff needs to be fully involved in the program full time. And then they need to return to their sending institution to enable for the transfer of knowledge. So uh, now we are going to look at the, the budget. As you can see, um, the budget is one unit cost per person per month. So the amount of the unit cost is 4,600, splitted half for the staff member and for the organization. The staff member has an amount of 2,300, which is a kind of allowance, meaning that they still uh, manage to touch their salary. The organization receives the um, 2,300, which is split between research, training, and networking, as well as between management and indirect costs, which are covered up to 1,000 euros. So in, in a summary, um, there are four key aspects of the program. First, the program is for a duration of four years and 360 p.m. per project. Second months last between one and 12 months per staff. And interdisciplinary second months need to be in the same sector within Europe, and they should constitute at, um, one third of the program. As I said before, the unit cost is 4,600, half for the staff allowance and half for the organization. And one call is usually of an amount of 75.5 million euros. So um, in case you are interested to participate in the staff exchanges pro program, um, I will now expose you with the key, pre the, um, I mean, the way to submit proposals um, and explain you what are the evaluation criteria to, for the program. So um, all calls are published on the funding and tender opportunities portal. Applications, all applications are submitted through the portal. Everything is online. So first of all, you need to search and find your call. Then you sign in to the portal and register your organization and you get what we call a pick. Then you can find your partners and of course then uh, you are ready to apply. For more information, you can see the link, the EPR link at the end of the slide. Here you can see a table with very detailed information on the evaluation criteria that I won't go into detail. So mainly you have the criteria of excellence, impact, quality and efficiency to the implementation. So um, now I will give you a little tip on um, successful staff exchanges pro project. So successful uh, staff exchanges project are uh, need to combine um, excellence in research and innovation activities and the quality and efficiency of the implementation. You should in particular pay attention to implementation plans and to the link between outputs and the different work packages. As you can see, excellence and implementation are closely interlinked. So um, I'll now, I would like to now indicate to you that actually uh, this workshop is very timely because today, there is a call that is uh, actually being open and uh, which is actually ending on the closing, sorry, on the 9th March, 2022. The amount is 72.5. Then in 2022, uh, you will have another call starting more or less around the same time on 6th of October, which will close around the 8th of March, 2023, and the amount will be slightly um, increased and will be of 77.5 million euros. 
So um, here are a few tips and tricks, but uh, yeah, since our time is limited, I won't go into the, those details and you can have a look on the presentation. I'll end my presentation by providing with an example of a project. So this project is called Rubicon 690850. It's a, the amount of the project is 607 and um, 606, sorry. 607 and 500, sorry, I, <laughs> and uh, it aims at increasing participants' knowledge um, underlying the diff diverse connective tissue disorders. As you can see, the consortium is of uh, 10 participants, composed of 10 participants, five from Europe and five from third countries. So I'll end my presentation here. I thank you for your attention. And if you want to have further information, please don't hesitate to contact us. Thank you. Thank you. Uh... Thank you very much. Um, we have Audrey who's trying to connect, but I think she's um, she's got some connection issues. Um, so we um, we're trying to uh, 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 make that work. Um, uh, so we'll um, Audrey will try and reconnect um, again. But I wonder, um, while all, um, Audrey's uh, trying to reconnect with a second, uh, with with her part of the presentation, whether we can actually um, uh, look at some questions and answers um, uh, already, because there's been a lot of uh, there's been a lot of engagement on the uh, on the chat and in the Q and A a section. And one of the things, um, and I don't know. Um, it, it, Claire or, or Deirdre or who, whoever wants to answer this, but I, I thought there was a really, um, so, so there was a, a you know, um, uh, Nancy talked about the, the importance about linking sort of product, you know, linking or, or turning ideas into products and services. And, and I just, and there's a really interesting um, question here, which is really about how we sort of rethink um, the structures and the topics and the, the the subjects of our universities. So how we, for instance, bring in bring together science and social science, uh, and so there, therefore rethink what the university does. I presume not, you know, in teaching and research, um, is, is that is that possible through through MSCA? Is is would that be a kind of application that one can also uh, imagine? I don't know if any of the questions uh, yeah. coming from under Erasmus it's possible, but I'll leave Claire her <laughs> to reply first. Claire, sorry, your 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 sound. Uh, your sound is still on. Yes, now we can, now we can hear. No. Now? Yes. Yes, yes. Um, I'm not sure I understood completely the question. As I said, the, the MSCA is, is, is open to all scientific disciplines. So any, any, I mean, any field of research and innovation, any disciplines, I mean, they, they, they can be uh, what we call hard sciences or, as you mentioned, human sciences, I mean, can be, can be covered, I mean, our, our, our can be covered by the program. So I have the, although I'm not sure I understood completely the question, but I have the impression that yes, um, we are, the, the program is, is, is really open to the kind of topics that you mentioned. So I, I guess it's, you, a, it's you, about, you it's, so, so I, I, I guess Claire, I, I, I presume part of the question partly comes from this perspective that um, in addition to thinking about intersectorality and so forth and, 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 and business and so forth, actually, you know, it, it, you know, a real important concern of science is, of course, also interdisciplinarity and how to reframe what it is that we do. And I guess the next generation of scholars is in a particularly good position to, to do this. And the question is whether, in a sense, MSCA could be a kind of interesting um, support 
for, for that kind of for those kinds of questions as well I, I think i think completely i mean interdisciplinarity i mean we've seen it now i mean solutions can to complex problem and to to the societal challenges can only be um, sold and and, and and addressed through uh, interdisciplinarity so yes i mean this is something that we're pushing very much for yes and perhaps just to add from the erasmus point of view like um, leslie's question i think was um also whether you know, they can rethink uh, the university and the functioning of the university. So experimental schools, for instance, that could be financed under Erasmus capacity building. So, right. um, yeah. Wonderful, so, so thank you very much for, for coming in. Um, Audrey, wonderful that you could, uh, uh, that, that we managed uh, in the end. So that's fantastic. It's great to see you, welcome. And uh, there, there's you. a, I think you, you want to go continue right from uh, uh, where Nancy left off. So maybe um, the floor is yours. Okay, thanks a lot. And then we can lot. come back to the question and, uh, afterwards. Okay, perfect. Thanks a lot. And sorry for, for, for this uh, technical issue. <laughs> um, okay, perfect. So you're, you are showing the slides already. Uh, so uh, uh, following uh, Nancy's uh, presentation, I will uh, now uh, give you an overview of um, the doctoral networks, uh, MSCA doctoral networks under uh, the new framework pro program Horizon Europe. Uh, and I will uh, uh, not give you as many details in terms of uh, uh, tips and tricks on the submission, but uh, I, I would be happy to, to give you more information afterwards. So uh, next slides, please. So the main, main objective of uh, those uh, networks of uh, doctoral researchers, uh, again, as Nancy mentioned and Claire previously, uh, MSCA is a fully bottom-up program, meaning that those networks are open to any uh, fields of research uh, uh, and uh, we don't have any uh, restrictions uh, on that. Uh, the objective is also to expose the recruited researchers in those networks to uh, both the academic and the non-academic sectors, so to have this intersectorial aspect, uh, and to offer them some uh, uh, innovative training, uh, not only in research, but also giving them some other competencies that uh, would be relevant uh, in terms of innovation and long-term employability. There is uh, in those uh, doctoral networks also a strong focus on research and transferable skills. Uh, we uh, also encourage uh, the, the, the recruited fellows to have secondments uh, in different sectors, uh, to uh, have a, ca a career development plan for each recruited fellows in a network. Uh, the supervision is also uh, very important. Uh, so as a, a principal investigator, if you want to be part of a doctoral network, uh, you as a supervisor, uh, uh, you will have also to describe uh, your experience uh, in the proposal. Uh, and international aspects are also a, 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 key, uh, a key element in uh, those doctoral networks. So uh, I will now give you some more information if you're interested in doctoral networks as an organization. The next slide, please. So if you want to apply as an organization, uh, you will uh, need to know uh, a bit uh, uh, the mo different modalities that we have in the doctoral networks. So those networks are multi-beneficiary actions. Uh, and the, uh, the objective is to set up a research and doctoral program. Uh, then uh, within those programs, you will be able, once the project is selected for funding, you will be able to recruit uh, doctoral candidates to implement uh, the research and doctoral program. There are, there are three different modalities, as Claire mentioned uh, previously. So you can uh, decide to be part of an industrial doctorate program that will offer a training in both academia and industry or the non-academic sector with a, a joint supervision of the recruited researchers. Uh, you can also decide to be part of a joint doctoral program that will uh, uh, offer uh, some joint or multiple doctoral degree to the recruited researchers uh, with a joint selection and supervision and uh, also uh, the pre-agreement for the joint or double degrees that is already required at the proposal stage. Uh, or you can also decide to uh, uh, be part of a more standard doctoral network that can offer training in uh, academia and or uh, in the non-academic sector. And you will see that we have some different eligibility conditions depending on the, on the modalities that you will uh, select. Uh, next slide, please. 
So in terms of the different features uh, uh, of the doctoral network, so the size can also vary from one modality to the other. Uh, and um, each uh, uh, doctoral network, standard doctoral network, can request up to 360 person months, which represent approximately 10 recruited researchers, doctoral candidates for three years. Uh, and if you want to be part of a, a joint or industrial doctoral program, you can request more uh, and up to 540 person months in total. So which uh, means uh, uh, on average 15 fellows for uh, recruited for uh, three years. So the duration of those projects is of uh, maximum 48 months. Usually you will be recruiting uh, the, the doctoral candidates for minimum three months and maximum 36 months. And of course, since uh, these are doctoral programs, we always encourage the beneficiaries to recruit uh, the researchers for the maximum duration. They will, uh, uh, the researchers will be uh, also uh, entitled to go for second months uh, a bit anywhere in the world, uh, and it will be limited uh, to one third of their fellowship uh, duration. In case you want to be part of an industrial doctorate, uh, we, uh, you will need also to pay attention since uh, fellows will have to spend minimum 50% of their time in the non-academic sector. And uh, this intersectoral uh, stay between academia and non-academic uh, organization uh, can be in the same country. So this is also a novelty compared to the previous uh, H2020 program. Next slide. So uh, who can apply in those doctoral networks? So as an organization, uh, usually in the networks, we have consortia of universities, research institution, or uh, businesses, including SMEs, or any other social economic actors. And we need at least three independent legal entities, each established in a different member state or uh, country associated to Horizon Europe with minimum one beneficiary from a member state. This is also a novelty for Horizon Europe. And on top of this minimum, what is important to know for you is that uh, any entity from any uh, third country can part participate as, as beneficiary or as associated partner. Um, and I will tell you more in, uh, in the next slide about that. Uh, and uh, you will have also to check some specific eligibility conditions for the industrial or the joint doctorate modalities. The next slide will show you uh, the different types of participants in terms of countries. So we have the member states, the EU countries, uh, and we have the non-EU countries, including the associated countries uh, to Horizon Europe and the low and middle income countries. And you have the full list of those countries uh, available in the Horizon Europe program guide. Uh, you have the link on the slide. Uh, and uh, uh, in this list, you have many countries uh, from, uh, from Africa, uh, for example, and those countries can benefit directly and receive directly uh, uh, EU funding. And in doctoral networks, they can fully participate as beneficiary as long as the minimum uh, conditions and requirements are fulfilled. So minimum three uh, uh, beneficiary from uh, member states or associated countries and one member state. Um, then if your country is not in this list, it means that you may uh, uh, be able to, um, to participate, uh, uh, but may, uh, may be not as beneficiary or uh, uh, in exceptional condition. So meaning that if your participation is deemed essential, and this is usually assessed by our expert evaluators, then you will be able to participate and receive uh, EU funding. On the next slide, uh, so in terms of uh, the different uh, uh, types of participants that we have, so you, you now know more about uh, who, uh, which country can participate and uh, with which condition. Uh, and as a, an organization, you will be uh, in two different sectors. So the academic or the non-academic sectors. And in MSCA, what we uh, include in the academic sectors in, in general uh, is uh, all the public and private higher education establishments, the public uh, of private nonprofit research organizations, or the international European research organizations. Everything else should be uh, in the non-academic sector, so which will 
also uh, widen a bit your possibilities to, uh, to be uh, a non-academic entity, for example, uh, if, you, if you are uh, um, NGO or um, businesses or companies or a small and medium enterprise. Um, then uh, uh, in those networks, you have uh, different profiles as well of participants. Uh, so you have uh, the, the, the fully involved uh, participants, which, uh, which we call beneficiaries. Uh, and you have the associated partners that are part also of uh, the activity of the project and fully part of the network, but with a slightly uh, uh, lighter role. And you will see the differences here in the table. Uh, for example, the beneficiary uh, are signing directly the grant agreement. They are also uh, responsible of the recruitment of the, the, the doctoral candidates and researchers, uh, and they will claim directly the cost to us. Whereas the associated partners uh, can uh, uh, be involved in uh, training or hosting of seconded researchers. They can participate uh, in the supervisory board as well uh, and uh, in different uh, dissemination activities of the project as well. The next slide. Uh, so you will uh, see as well that uh, as beneficiary, you will have to uh, respect some uh, specific rules. And one of them is for doctoral networks is that all beneficiaries uh, must recruit at least one doctoral candidate. So this is uh, mandatory. So if you want to be a beneficiary, you have to recruit at least one researcher. Uh, another rule that uh, should be respected in each consortium uh, is that no more than 40% of the requested uh, EU budget uh, may be allocated to beneficiaries in the same country. Uh, so this was done also to, uh, to have a, a kind of a, a balanced distribution uh, uh, in each uh, consortia, consortia uh, so that we don't have uh, uh, always the same countries involved in one consortium or not uh, uh, the majority uh, going to, uh, to only one country. Um, and for this, you will always have a warning uh, in the submission process in case you're reaching uh, those, uh, those uh, limits. So if uh, your project is selected uh, for funding, then you will have as a network to recruit uh, eligible uh, doctoral researchers. Uh, and for this, uh, you, they will have also to fulfill some eligibility conditions. Uh, and one of them uh, is that they should all be doctoral candidates, meaning that they should not be already in possession of a doctoral degree at the date of their recruitment. Um, they must be all enrolled in the doctoral program, uh, recognized at least in one EU member state or associated country to Horizon Europe, or at least two uh, member states or associated countries for the joint doctoral uh, program. They can be of any nationality, they, we don't have any restrictions uh, on, on that, but they will have to fulfill the mobility rule, meaning that they must not have resided or, or worked in the country of the recruiting beneficiary for more than a year in the last three years before the recruitment date. As the next slides will show you, uh, will give you a, a full overview of all eg eligibility conditions and minimum requirements for uh, each modality of the doctoral networks, the DN, uh, standard doctoral networks, the ID, industrial doctorates, and the GD, joint doctorates. Uh, I will not go into too many details, uh, but it's a good, uh, it's a good recap uh, 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 also uh, to, to have with you when, uh, when you start uh, um, preparing your application. The so next slide is about the budget structure. So as mentioned already by Nancy, in MSCA, we have a, a, a unit cost uh, funding mechanism, so which is uh, very simple for you as a, a future beneficiary uh, uh, as well. Uh, so which means that one unit cost represents, uh, in our case, one month of an eligible, eligible uh, recruited researcher. The reimbursement rate is 100% for uh, uh, doctoral networks, and uh, the budget will be divided into different cost categories. You will see in the next slide the different categories. Uh, so you will have, you will receive some uh, some budget um, for all the allowances that will go to the researchers, to the recruited doctoral candidates, the living allowance uh, that will be uh, multiplied by a country correction coefficient. Uh, then the fellow uh, will also have to receive a mobility allowance, uh, a family allowance if it's applicable, 
Uh, and then um, as a, the uh, organization, you will also receive some uh, institutional uh, budget covering all the expenses uh, uh, for the, your research, training and networking activities, but also uh, to cover your expenses for management and indirect uh, costs. So for the first uh, course under Horizon Europe, uh, we have uh, currently our doctoral uh, network for 2021 open and the, uh, the closing date is on the 16th of November, so approaching, with a, a budget uh, around uh, 403 million euro for this first call. And then next year we'll have a similar uh, uh, schedule for the, the 2022 call with a slightly higher budget. And as also briefly mentioned by Claire before, uh, in case uh, you want to apply as an individual PhD candidate, which uh, could also be the case among the audience, I don't know, uh, then it means that uh, you will have to uh, look for uh, opportunities and vacancies uh, in already funded MSCA uh, projects. So for the moment, these are still the H2020 ITN projects, but maybe in the future, as of uh, next year, uh, you could also start looking for opportunities in MSCA DN funded projects. And all those vacancies are published, as already mentioned by Claire, on the EURACCESS uh, portal under the job section. You also have uh, a daily update uh, for all MSCA specific vacancies uh, on the MSCA uh, website. And uh, I thank you very much uh, for your attention. And if you have any questions, uh, I will be happy to reply now with, uh, together with uh, Claire and Nancy. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Oli. That was a fantastic, uh, wide ranging presentation. And I would actually uh, like to really encourage um, participants, especially from outside the EU, to really look at the EURACCESS portal because it also has some really interesting and important visa information. You know, so that the website is uh, 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 used a lot for that kind of information. It's a really supportive uh, instrument. Um, can I, uh, so, so I think one person that we haven't yet uh, introduced um, is uh, Berta uh, Vizcara Mir, who, who will also join in this uh, Q&A section. So, so Berta, um, uh, welcome also. Um, so uh, can, can I, first of all, um, actually um, ask, about the associated countries and third countries. So, and can I ask about Europe here? So um, we hope of course that the UK will be an associated third country in Switzerland soon, um, but, but um, if they were third countries, um, what, how would they be, would it be possible to collaborate with partners there alongside Africa and Europe uh, and the EU and EEA? Uh, I will reply for doctoral networks, maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so um, for, for the UK, I think uh, the, the agreement is, uh, is on track, I would say. Uh, but uh, <laughs> I think, yeah, uh, for Switzerland, uh, it's true that uh, it's a bit more blurry. Uh, uh, but uh, we encourage you also to regularly uh, uh, check uh, any updates about, uh, about the association to Horizon Europe. Uh, the, the good thing is that uh, we we all agreed to uh, um, to 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 wait uh, until the the signature of the grant uh, the last signature of the grant agreement uh, uh, preparation in order to um, to 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 check uh, if the agreement uh, and if the association is in place or not. Meaning that uh, uh, during the call and during the evaluation, for the moment, we will consider all uh, potential. Uh, uh, countries associated to Horizon Europe who launch already their um, their process uh, as an associated country. Uh, and then we will double check when we will be at the stage of signing the grant agreement if the agreement is indeed in place. Uh, okay. Let's let's hope, but it will give uh, give uh, give us and they give everybody normally normally few few more months uh, so that uh, all the agreements uh, and association are in place. For Switzerland, uh, again, uh, uh, it's still uh, it, it's still not clear, uh, but uh, but uh, in case a country uh, would not be associated and would be uh, uh, considered as a third country. Uh, not in the list of low or middle uh, income countries, uh, then it means that they could eventually uh, request uh, exceptional funding if they can really uh, justify and, um, and show that they have a, a, an essential role in the project, uh, or they could also uh, participate as associated partner. 
Okay. This is that, also that's another it. possibility. That, yeah. That's very helpful. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, one question from Mark, which is that, that it seems that many of the career actions involve global partnerships. Could they be just about EU and Africa? Yes, of course. I can, I can, it's true that I gave we gave examples of uh, global partnership, but they can be as long as the minimum requirements are um, are fulfilled, which were presented both by Audrey and Nancy. Then uh, it can be uh, only between uh, between Europe and Africa, of course. Mm -hmm. um, and. Uh And I, I'd like to say as well, uh, maybe if, if it was not clear, that for individual researchers, so for uh, doctoral candidates, I mean, the nationality really doesn't count uh, for the, it, it's really open, as you mentioned, I mean, on your access, these positions um, of uh, doctoral candidates are published, and the program is open to researchers from all over the world without any, I mean, there is uh, no, no limitation. For organizations, there are some limitations. It means that the uh, usually the organizations cannot receive direct funding from the commission or from the EU, but then, uh, I mean, there can be uh, uh, agreements between themselves. Mm -hmm. and, and just in a ballpark figure, can you, uh, can you, do, could you give us a kind of sense of how large, how many participants you expect a network to have? I mean, typically? I mean, you were talking about minimum numbers, but it might be quite helpful for people. Um, it's a yeah. question also coming from Mark. Yes, on average, under H2020, we had uh, nine beneficiaries in each network uh, with approximately uh, seven, eight uh, associated partners. So this is uh, on average. Um, now, with a slightly reduced uh, size of the, the standard doctoral networks, maybe we'll have a, a, a slightly lower average of, uh, of beneficiaries per, per network. But, uh, but uh, yes, it's between six and, and nine usually. Mm -hmm. And um, is, is it possible to um, um, support this? Uh, so this is from Fabrice Bond. Uh, or band. Um, um, is it possible to support the uh, traveling lab work for the student who can, um, who has access in one European lab but doesn't have any support for that at the moment? So I guess you, so you were outlining some of the costs that can be covered. So is it, is it really possible when they go to Europe that in a sense the, um, the traveling lab work can be supported? Yes, uh, yes, there is a cost category covering all uh, Uh, all expenses for research, training activities, but also conference attendance, uh, uh, travel and accommodation costs in case of uh, secondment to other beneficiaries or associated partner. So uh, this is, a, this is a, a unit cost category also. So we don't uh, ask for a, a full breakdown, a full detail of the expenses. Uh, so there is, uh, there is uh, some, uh, yes, some po many possibilities. Huh? And, and, and there was just something again on, on, on one of the, an additional question on one of the slides. So, so the slides seem to suggest that students have to be enrolled in an EU member country, is that right? Um, or can they also be enrolled in a non-member country? Uh, they can, uh, so they, for standard doctoral networks and uh, industrial doctorates, they have to be enrolled uh, in one Uh, EU member states or uh, I mean in an organization based in the EU member state or associated country uh, but uh, but then uh, if they want to also be uh, enrolled uh, in a in a country outside in a third country it would mean that it's a kind of a double or or joint degree so um, okay yeah. so, so can I just add, add so so <coughs> next we can jump straight to Rebecca Ackerman's um, Uh, question, which I think is probably quite important. So it's and I read out. It's it's slightly longer, but I think it's important. So she she writes. I'm currently an associate partner in an MSCA doctoral training network and co-supervising a South African South African student who's registered in Copenhagen. I'm slightly confused here. Can the network be between African countries with the European partners, with African institutions as beneficiaries, meaning that African doctoral candidates from one institution can be trained in another African institution? Or can African doctoral candidates only be trained in Europe? So I guess it's really again about the question about intra-African collaboration and how that relates to the African-European um, collaboration. Um, uh, I, I, I see. 
institution in in uh, in Africa that uh, uh, would be in the list uh, uh, to receive uh, di directly automatically the EU funding could participate as beneficiaries. They could recruit uh, uh, researchers. Um, they could enroll them in their own doctoral program, let's say, but they will also have then to be uh, uh, enrolled uh, uh, in an um, EU member state or associated country. This is uh, this is uh, um, this is uh, a, a change compared to uh, to H2020, where, for example, in uh, in the standard uh, ETN European Training Networks, we didn't have the mandatory uh, uh, doctoral um, uh, enrollment, so it was a, a, a bit uh, maybe uh, a more flexible. Uh, so meaning that. If you want to participate as a beneficiary uh, in Africa, you, you may think of uh, this double degree. Mm -hmm. And Mareike from Radboud University is asking whether, so, so the enrollment of the PhD candidates, that should happen within the MSCA program once approved or beforehand? As during, I presume, as part of the application. Uh, no, no, uh, no, no. This, this, uh, during the program, at the beginning of the program, the one of the deliverable of the project will be that all uh, recruited researchers are enrolled in the doctoral program. Uh, and uh, during the project implementation, we make sure that uh, this, uh, this is fulfilled. Uh, the, the, the obligation is to enroll, is not to... Uh, to, uh, to award the PhD because uh, we know that uh, it's research as well and uh, everything can happen. Uh, but, uh, but the minimum conditions are checked during the project implementation. Mm -hmm. Maybe mm -hmm. if I can add something here, um, the, um, the uh, organizations in the consortium need to publish the post so they do not know in advance who will apply. It's once the program is approved, then they publish the positions and candidates, excellent candidates from all over the world. And in this particular case, for example, for, for, from Africa can apply, but they do not know once at application stage, they, I mean, they have not yet selected the uh, doctoral candidates. There should be a transparent, um, uh, let's say recruitment procedure. Mm -hmm. Yes, but what, what we ask at the proposal stage is to have already uh, uh, the, org the organization and all the arrangements more or less in place. So uh, where the potential candidates will be enrolled in, uh, in, in, the, do in the doctoral program. Um, Claire, you've already, you know, so, so I know that you have to leave very uh, slightly early uh, ahead of time. Uh, but, but of course, thank you very, very much for, for giving, being so generous with your time and input already. Can I maybe just ask you, uh, before I get back to some of the other questions, um, from your perspective, what, what is the thing that you maybe as, as head of unit really hope that this program will achieve most? What, what, what would you really advise from your own perspective, from what you see? Uh, to, what would you apply applicants or institutions to think about most as they, as they really sort of try and embrace this opportunity? So I think that, first of all, a lot of um, uh, partnership and some strong partnerships have been um, established or developed in the framework of Erasmus. And Erasmus, I mean, the, the let's say the access to Erasmus funds is much, is much, I mean, it's, it's less competitive, it's much easier. So I would really advise those organizations that are or have already developed networks, have already worked together in the framework of, of Erasmus to start applying for, um, for, for, for MSCA, which is maybe the more, I mean, it's, it's more difficult, it's more, um, the comp there, there is more competition, but they have already, I mean, they, they have the, 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 all the, uh, let's say, the, 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 the partnerships, the projects that they have developed together will help them really to uh, apply for MSCA. And I would say that the first uh, entry point, uh, at least in my, in my view, I mean, the easiest one is through the staff exchanges, which allows really organizations to work together concretely on their RNI projects, and then they can be ready for the next steps, which is the doctoral networks, which is probably, I mean, which is where there is more competition and the success rate are, uh, are, are, are lower. Um, but uh, I think there is a lot of interest amongst uh, European organizations to partner with uh, organizations in Africa. What, me, what they probably miss, especially I think in, in Africa, maybe it's the access to these networks. So those that uh, have been established in the framework of Erasmus can really be interesting entry point for, uh, for MSCA. So it's good that today we're presenting both programs.
and and there, there was a there was a question that um, um, to Deirdre's uh, Deirdre's presentation, which uh, around the sustainability. So what happens afterwards? And and I guess. Um, I mean, would you would you kind of just join in her advice to really think about kind of um, you know the long term perspective of, of the network as well as part of the application? No, I, I, no, yes, I, and I, and uh, it's part in fact I think of uh, the, the the overall assessment of the, the partnership. I think the uh, if there is a long term vision, if the, the the doctoral network or the staff exchange projects are part of the overall strategy of the university of its internationalization strategy if it's you know not a one of uh, application uh, I, I, I think this has a strong weight as well mm -hmm. great thank you very especially much especially talking especially mm -hmm. talking about the development of doctoral programs where i mean once the program is uh, is, is over it's true that the, 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 the uh, let's say the organization needs to think once the, when they apply what will happen uh, afterwards so i think it's important to look in uh, to have this uh, uh, more um, i mean a long term perspective and um, it needs to be seen in the um, institutional i mean in the institutional strategy of the different organizations yes mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Claire. That's that's uh, that was very clear. Um, I'll go back to the, some of the questions. So so there was a question that I've, I've that that that, that uh, has been there for a while now. So and then that's really about the participant identification code. Whether that's the same for institution, irrespective of, of Erasmus Plus and MSCA. Sorry, so is it the same across all programs, basically? It's the same. It's the same one across um, M um, Horizon and Erasmus. Right. Um, uh, okay. So, so Ada, that that was that was uh, your your question. Yes. Sorry, I pressed the button. By the <laughs> <way>. <laughs> um, uh, is there an Erasmus Plus program for postdoctoral research applicants? No, there is not. I mean, this is part of um, of the MSCA, and it's an action which we have not presented today because it was not really the focus of the discussions. We could do it maybe during another event. <laughs> but I mean, mm. the, I, I mentioned five actions. Today we presented two of these actions. There is one for postdoctoral um, researchers, in, but in fact, there is an ongoing call which is closing next week. So maybe for the next call, we could organize a mm. similar event. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely. And as, um, as I mentioned, really yeah. Mm. No, as I mentioned, it's both for uh, European researchers, experienced researchers interested in doing their research outside uh, Europe and for, for example, uh, African researchers to come and do uh, their uh, research or part of their research in Europe. And here, the number of postdoctoral candidates who have successfully applied to the scheme from Africa is very low. So here, I think that a dedicated event would uh, be welcome. So we're ready uh, to, to join. If you're Thank you very much. We will we will take this up. Um, so so uh, and then there's a really interesting intriguing question from Kennedy in Tanzania um, around um, the offer of online doctoral programs and maybe um, in, in answering that um, maybe to think about how whether there is a possibility and opportunity to think about the, the the transformation in the way in which we do research and education now in terms of the in terms of online space because of course this is effectively about physical mobility but but uh, you know it's it, are you also you know presumably you know applicant applications would also include the online dimension right hello sounds yes i don't know if audrey wants to to, to take it but for us it's important um I mean, this, let's say this physical mobility is a key feature of the MSCA. So we still, we still think it's very important for researchers to have the possibility to spend some time in a completely different um, research environment, cultural environment. So it remains an important feature of the program. Of course, we, have, we are flexible and we were very flexible during the uh, um, COVID uh, the time. And, and if uh, researchers could not travel or whatever, we had to adapt. Mm, and uh, and we will continue to be flexible, but I, th I think it's the same for Erasmus. We believe that it's essential for the uh, let's say the research experience uh, for for the researchers to be physically mobile. And just maybe and, to, uh, to to complement, 
Yeah. Uh, yeah please, okay. Please. Okay. Um, uh, yes, it's true that uh, we also uh, uh, saw an evolution in terms uh, uh, of the doctoral programs that could be offered to all uh, researchers in those networks. And for example, training programs are more and more online. There are uh, many uh, virtual or remote uh, uh, training uh, 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 ways, uh, uh, and um, and it's not a fully remote program per se, as Claire mentioned, the physical mobility is still a key aspect of the program, uh, but uh, through the, the, diff the different trainings that can be offered, we see a, a clear evolution. Um, and uh, virtual mobility uh, will also be uh, uh, accepted in the future, for example, for part of the, the secondment that will take place uh, uh, for the researchers. Wonderful. Um, can I, uh, thank you for the for this response. Uh, my colleagues from the Guild Office have also put a uh, a link uh, into the chat about a recent report on the synergies uh, between um, Erasmus Plus and MSCA that might be of interest uh, in response to these questions. Um, and uh, if, uh, so, so that that's uh, I think really good further reading. Uh, may I uh, maybe just come now to the uh, to to starting to wrap up. So first of all, maybe. Uh, Julie Lepetre from the uh, uh, again from the from DG uh, EAC. Uh, you, you've you've been um, uh, uh, working. Uh, you've been kindly waiting for for your turn, but also to asking to Deirdre back uh, to maybe just offer some uh, some uh, closing reflections on next uh, steps and uh, and uh, useful tips. Our uh, floor is yours. Um, thank you. I'll I'll start. Uh, Julie has agreed. <laughs> This is not me budging it. Um, I'd, I'd just like to thank you uh, for this opportunity. I think it was a great idea including Erasmus and uh, Marie Curie together because also in relation to what Claire uh, said is that um, really there's this emphasis on, you know, the build-up depending, uh, you know, you can go in step by step into our programs and uh, build up cooperation and uh, build, you know, depending on the, the, the type of, uh, of action available and um, or di diversify, so to say, what, what you intend doing uh, across the two programs to really uh, meet, meet the different needs of your, of your institution or organization. Um, so I think that's very good. It's considering the, uh, you know, sort of the, um, emphasis we want on to have uh, impact at least um sub-sahara africa north africa it's a big region uh funds are to a certain extent limited even if we've had you know a, a significant increase um networks in africa uh exist the regional sort of the regional integration processes are there um our member states are there also with their own bilateral programs and i think um, if uh, African um, uh, higher education research organizations can really um, complement efforts and put all these different elements together, um, they'll be much stronger, I think, in, in, in acceding in, you know, accessing, uh, accessing the funding. And that's what we want to see. We want to, we want to see an increase uh, of participation and, uh, and use this money that's been made, made available. I think that's very important. Judy? Um, yes, actually, I had to... Uh, good morning to all, first of all, because indeed <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's my turn now to speak a bit, but I will be very quick. Uh, actually, I just had a, a PowerPoint presentation. I don't know if Laura uh, could eventually share it. Yes, thank you. Thanks a lot. I will be very quick as well. Actually, I just wanted to... Uh, to, to, to Focus or to highlight again that indeed, um, you know, in, in, in the Horizon Europe, we will really continue uh, as uh, regards the MSCA to, to play a key role in, uh, in training highly skilled and adaptable and resilient researchers. And I just wanted to, to say also that actually we have a new motto in the Horizon Europe, which, which is developing talents, advancing research. And it is really meant to highlight the, the essence of the MSCA, meaning excellence, research, and development of skills. Um, I would like just to say a few words in kind of a not, you know, in a nutshell, just to, to summarize a bit what was uh, said. So if we can go to the next slide, please. Thanks a lot. So, I won't go first into the details again because you you have heard about uh, the doctoral networks and about staff exchanges. Thanks to my colleagues 
which I would like actually to, to thank as well uh, for their for their presentations. But just here you have a summary, uh, a table which summarize actually what uh, can be uh, uh, the opportunities for uh, African partners. So uh, just again in a nutshell here, organizations from Africa, you can see that they can participate as uh, uh, beneficiaries or associated partners and actually uh, African uh, organizations can participate as associated partner to doctoral networks, staff exchanges, postdoctoral fellowships, and COFUN, meaning all the actions uh, uh, under the uh, Marie Skodowska Curie uh, program, and as beneficiary only to doctoral networks. I won't go back to this because it was already said before, so if we can move to the next slide. Thank you. As regards the uh, individuals, uh, so individuals from Africa can uh, participate uh, in uh, the MSCA, again, in all the main actions. I just would like here to highlight that for doctoral networks, individuals apply to the program of their choice through the Euraccess job portal. And you will see a slide just after that one uh, with all the useful links. For staff exchanges, uh, staff participate through the standing institutions. These you have uh, got the information thanks to uh, my colleague Nancy. Postdoctoral fellowships, as Claire mentioned, hopefully uh, we'll have the possibility to address also that uh, action uh, in another maybe seminar or meeting. Uh, so here researchers have to find a host organization. And for COFUND, uh, here as well, individuals apply through the Euraccess job portal. If we could go to the next slide, you will see that uh, we have offers ongoing calls and we'll have some upcoming calls. So uh, I believe that this presentation will be shared with you all so that you can have in mind what are the next steps as regards the MSCA. So as Claire mentioned, and as well my colleague, um, the call for staff exchanges uh, opens today. Uh, for the uh, other one, doctoral networks is still uh, ongoing, uh, but you can see that in 2022, you'll have again, some other opportunities for doctoral networks, postdoctoral fellowships, and of course, staff exchanges as well. So it's really important that you uh, may uh, follow these, uh, these uh, calls to come and that you start preparing, of course, also uh, by getting, for instance, trainings. And this is the next slide. If we can go to the next one, it would be great next one still because this one will be also shared yes thanks a lot so here i just would like to, to to highlight that actually yes it's important to uh, prepare a bit in advance your your applications and for this you have here all the useful links uh you have of course uh, the Mahes Kodos Hacking Actions website, but you have also all the information as regard uh, the uh, the calls and the funding and tenders portal, uh, and as regard the training possibilities of a uh, possibility, sorry, of uh, getting some trainings or further information. Uh, please keep in mind that you can uh, use your access uh, website to ask uh, questions or to get further information. And actually, what is interesting is that there, there will be now a new uh, office uh, for Africa, which will be uh, fully implemented in 2022. But there is already uh, some possibilities to uh, to ask questions. And we would like us to, uh, to, um, to get further contact with the, uh, the, the, the desk for Africa in order to uh, provide some further uh, information seminars for each of the actions uh, for you to, to have uh, very practical tips on each of the actions. Uh, you can also rely on the Marie Curie Alumni Association, uh, which uh, includes actually an African chapter. So here as well, you may find some interesting information and offers national contact points, uh, which are all, all, always very good uh, um, um, help uh, for for these uh, for these uh, for these actions. Um, so I of course sorry just last one point if you have any further very practical question you have the research inquiry service where you can really ask questions about the ongoing calls i will stop here because i didn't want to take too much time but just for you to to see that there are plenty of possibilities and opportunities also to get further information we'll be happy also uh, to, to to help and really uh, we are hoping for uh, and encouraging actually for further participation of uh, african organizations and researchers so I will stop here with these uh, last words. Thanks a lot.
Thank you. Thank you so much, Julie. Thank you so much, Deirdre. Thanks so much, colleagues from, from the Commission, um, for this fantastic overview. Um, before um, passing the word to Ernest for some closing remarks, I just wanted to um, um, say that with your permission, I think we've already said this in the chat, with your permission, colleagues, uh, we will, we will um, pass on the presentations to all the participants so that we can share the information uh, that you've given us in detail as widely uh, as possible. Um, Ernest, um, over to you. Um, you've uh, maybe we, we can sort of finish with some co concluding reflections from your part. Uh, thank you very, very, very much, Jan. And I, I'm very happy with the way everything has gone uh, this morning. Um, it's it's uh, actually it's gone well beyond what I expected uh, as an info session. I mean. The, the quality of the presentations has been very, very high. I believe that participants, both from Africa and from Europe and elsewhere, uh, should be satisfied with the information they received uh, today as a result of, of what we uh, received. Uh, we, we should be able to think in a more structured way about how as Arua and the Guild uh, will be able to engage uh, together and engage with the various European universities. I'm very happy uh, that uh, the Arua universities have embraced this. I, I do also see signs that our European partners are very, very much uh, on top of things. Let me thank uh, the DG IAC for the opportunity. I mean, they've been really helpful by making sure that uh, uh, the, this event will take place and giving us people to speak to us. The same way we'd like to thank the European Research Executive Agency for the support. Uh, I was very pleased to listen to Deirdre Lennon uh, in her presentation. It, it, it allowed us to see how the European uh, initiative is working. Uh, we all got to see how Erasmus Plus program now functions, the expansion that has taken place, the resources available and how we can all uh, take advantage of it. Thank you very much, Deirdre. Uh, we then went on to listen to Claire, Claire Morel. Uh, Claire focused on the opportunities under MSC, uh, the very broad introduction that allowed us to get a good insight into how MSC functions. Uh, she was supported uh, by Nancy, Nancy Jokutu Pomenya. Uh, Nancy focused on the MSC staff exchanges. Uh, this clearly was also something that many of our participants are very interested in, and uh, we're looking forward to seeing an enhanced situation of staff exchanges within the region and between the region and uh, Europe. Uh, Audrey uh, focused on the doctoral networks, the MS MSCA doctoral networks. Um, that gave us a fair idea of how these uh, networks function. We saw the uh, mention of the industrial networks, we saw the mention of the uh, standard networks, we saw the, the joint doctorates and then the, uh, um, the what do you call it, the, the industrial doctorates. So it's my hope that uh, having given us this uh, overview of how these things are going to work, uh, many more people from the region will be participating and applying for grants. Uh, Julie has just given us a, a, a very good, solid access to information how do we as uh, Africans, how do we as European partners uh, work together? What sort of information is available to us? Uh, I'm very happy on behalf of Arua and the Guild to thank everybody who has joined us today. Uh, when we began, there were about 105 participants. Uh, I've seen that the numbers have gone down a little as we come to, towards the end. I thank all of you uh, for making time uh, to spend that time with us. I thank you for the questions that you raised. Those questions were clear indications that uh, you've appreciated what we've been offered, that you paid attention to all those things. And I believe that the Guild and Arua will go again deeper into those questions and see how best uh, we will answer them. So as we come to the end, let me thank all of you and do hope that um, you will take part in other activities that uh, the Guild and Narua will be hand, uh, organizing. In November, uh, we shall, Arua will host this uh, third biennial conference in Pretoria and also participate virtually. And then after that, on the 22nd of November, uh, we will have our joint uh, event and conference also 
looking at how best we can push forward our doctoral education programs and all that that we are interested in. Um, very, we, we, we want to be in a situation where we can support the European Union and the African Union in the push towards Agenda 2063. Uh, so this conference will be about that. This conference will be about how we can, as researchers, uh, position ourselves to push this. So we'll be bringing people from the higher education uh, sector in both uh, Europe and Africa to discuss this. So on that note, uh, I'm very pleased on behalf of the Guild and Narua to declare our event formally closed. Thank you very much for your involvement. Thank you.